There we go. God, it's been a couple weeks since I have done this. I almost forgot how to unmute everybody and get everybody going on. <laughs> Regardless, hello everyone. Another week, another episode of the Metal Blade Live series. I am here this week with Anton Reisenegger of Criminal. I am your host, Riley McShane, singer for A Legion. How's it going, man? Yeah, pretty good, man. Been pretty busy uh, promoting this new album. Yeah. Um, yeah, a lot of interviews all over the world. So it's 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 cool, man. I, I I like the fact that people are taking notice that we have something new coming out. Well, yeah, man. I mean, you guys have uh, been been around for a while. Uh, for those of you watching who may not know, uh, Criminal has eight previous full length albums and are releasing their new album, uh, Sacrificio, on. September 17th, so just in like a couple days here. And uh, I want to get a little bit into the history of of you as an artist and your history in the metal scene because I feel like people may not know the the background there before Criminal and leading into Criminal and the past 30 years of the band. So your first band, Pentagram, uh big fan by the way your first band pentagram formed in 1985 and influenced tons of huge bands at the gates dismember napalm death uh became really popular oh yeah yeah tons tons man tons and uh you became really popular through the the tape trading scene if i you know uh i'm getting my history right what was it like being in not only the metal scene but particularly the chilean metal scene uh as a latin american metal band in the mid 80s um a lot of people tend to romanticize this era you know and they say like in the 80s everything was better and stuff you know but uh it was actually very hard you know because uh you couldn't get like proper gear to to to, to play through you it was very hard to find like a studio and a sound engineer who could actually uh make you sound the way you want it you know always had to be fighting oh put up the guitars you know <laughs> it's, it was always about the guitars they were never loud enough you know and, and that kind of stuff you know uh but the the whole the whole climate of the country was was very very adverse you know because you have to remember that we're talking about the last few years of the the the, the Pinochet dictatorship, you know. Um, so um, the the whole atmosphere was pretty charged, pretty intense, and not very um, very uh, how can I say very fertile for a band playing satanic death metal back in the day you know the, the catholic church still had a huge influence on the media on the government you know um police would come to our shows and shut them down and just beat everyone and and uh, or take them away on on their police buses and stuff like that so uh it, it, it was definitely an interesting time i uh sometimes wonder what was it that that drove us to to do all the stuff we did, you know, with, when, when everything seemed to be against us, you know, but uh, I'm glad I did in the end, you know, yeah. and, uh, and, and actually, you know, you, you, you say what you said about, you know, the, the band influencing other, you know, European bands and stuff like that. Um, that was weird because that kind of happened after the band was already disbanded, you know, after we split up the, like, or we did only two demos with three songs each but they kind of seem to take on a life of their own, you know, right. and all of a sudden, like in the mid nineties, I was seeing pictures of this member wearing pentagram shirts and napalm death, you know, Mitch Harris with a pentagram shirt and stuff like that, you know, and, and I was like, fuck man. I mean, this is weird. I mean, we only, we were just this little band from Chile, but in a way we had an impact, but well, I'm, I'm very proud, you know, to, to, um, like just having contributed to 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 shape in a way the the extreme metal scene the way it is now yeah you know? no absolutely and it's it's so interesting to hear this kind of perspective from someone who you know really did like help shape the the death metal scene as we know it today uh it's easy sometimes i feel to take for granted especially as a modern listener where 
the genre started and how big of an impact things had back then. It, you know, today, even if someone was doing something pretty different or, you know, radically not in line with what is expected from death metal, if they only released two, three song EPs, it would just get, it would just vanish within a matter of, of <laughs> days, weeks, you know, it wouldn't be a, a huge, just ripple affecting huge kind of thing like what Pentagram was. Um, so it's, it's really interesting to, to hear this, uh, perspective because it's, it's such a, a long gone phenomena in my, in my opinion. It's, uh, it's such a thing that so rarely happens these days. And, uh, yeah, well, it's, it's, um, really back in the day, you know, it, it was, maybe we had the, the, uh, the advantage that there weren't that many bands around but when we started in 85 you know we 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 kind of had this vision and then in 87 we recorded both our demos and um but pretty soon already we felt that the uh, scene was being overcrowded you know that there were a lot of bands coming coming out just trying to sound like whatever they liked, you know, whatever their influences were, you know, not really bringing anything new to the table. And I think uh, what Pentagram did, we did actually bring something new to the table. I mean, even, even if you compare us to, for instance, the Brazilian scene of the time with Sarcophago and Holocausto, the early Sepultura and stuff like that, it was very different. You know, we were trying to do something somewhat technical, interesting with different time signatures and stuff like that. Whereas the Brazilian death metal band was just about yeah. brutality. You know, oh, yeah. so so I think we 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 made a difference, and that was what uh, actually propelled us into the minds of people like you know whatever at the gate stark throne or, or all those bands who, who mentioned us later on you know yeah which has to be so cool seeing a band from gothenburg right wearing your shirt that they got how right like mail ordered it all the way from chile like that's that's like incredible uh no no, no, no that was all bootlegs or someone yeah. made it i don't know <laughs> we, we definitely we didn't see a dime from those shirts man uh, i tell you shit. but 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 but, it, but in hindsight it doesn't really matter i mean the the respect we got was so great you know and yeah. uh, as a matter of fact when well i think you, we're going to touch upon this later but when i moved to the to to europe you know and i i, I landed in england and I met all those guys, you know, apart from the Napalm guys, I, I already knew, you know, people from Benediction and all these other bands, Cancer and all these other bands. Uh, they, 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 there was really a lot of respect, you know, and they immediately opened the door for me and it, 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 like treated me like one more one one of the guys, you know, that's so cool, man. Well, got to Got to give respect where respect is due. So I want to touch on something that you mentioned about the Brazilian scene and a, and a question that I have here. Did so did you really get in touch with the Cavalera brothers by writing them letters back in the 80s? Yeah, that was the way people connected back then. You yeah. know, there was no social media. Um, actually, I think the, the tape trading circuit back then was was kind of a, a proto social network. You know, it yeah. was a social network, just not just a a, a uh, analog one not a yeah. digital one you know what i mean um but uh, yeah th this is it's absolutely true i um so i got a hold of a brazilian magazine called rock brigade and uh, there was an interview printed with sepultura they seemed interesting to me you know and the the back then it was um common practice that uh, you would print like the the band's address below the interview you know or the beyond the whatever the review you were doing so yeah i just wrote them and later on actually uh max and igor's mom told me that my letter was the first one they got from out of brazil nice <laughs> nice yeah That's so cool. yeah i got in, i got in touch with them because i was doing a fanzine myself back then you know so i got in touch with them just to get like an interview questionnaire kind of thing going and then when i finished school uh, in I finished school at the end of '86, so um, in, uh, in the summer, well, we got a different summer. We got summer in the south in uh, January, February, right? Right. So um, that's when I, I I wanted to take a trip to Brazil with a with a friend of mine, 
And um, I mentioned this to Max and he said, yeah, just come over to the house, you know? And uh, so we ended up spending like, I don't know, a week or something like that at the Cavalera house in Belo Horizonte. And we attended, it was very funny because they were, they were uh, just releasing uh, Morbid Visions. Right. And uh, there was a TV commercial and they were all like the whole family would gather in front of the TV when they knew that at that time the TV commercial would air, air you know, so <laughs> it was very funny. And, and they were, they were already writing for schizophrenia. I went to a couple of rehearsals, you know, I saw them live as well. So yeah, it was a pretty cool time. Man. That's so cool, man. I, uh, I toured with them. God, I want to say in like 20, 2015, 2016, uh, mm -hmm. with, uh, not Sepultura, but the Cavalera conspiracy. Uh, yeah. super nice guys, man. Super, super nice guys. Do you still keep in touch with them at all today? I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, uh, be able to say I keep in touch with them, but uh, when, uh, they, the, the, the Cavalera brothers played Santiago like two, three years ago, I, uh, well, I knew the promoter, so I got myself backstage, you know, and, nice. uh, yeah, it was immediately like, Hey, uh, yeah. such a long time, big hugs and stuff. And. And uh, do you want to play a song with us? <laughs> I'm like, what? Yeah. what? <laughs> yeah, and uh, I, I actually played Troops of Doom with them on stage. Dude, you know? hell yeah. That's so sick. <laughs> so, so, yeah, that was, that was pretty great, man. It was pretty cool. Dude, that's awesome, man. That's awesome. Well, so I, I want to, you know, as, as much as I could talk about the, the history of death metal, which is something that I'm pretty passionate about and very interested in, I want to talk about... Uh, criminal the band that you're in now which i guess still has quite a bit of history behind it uh 30 years this year actually you guys formed in 1991 so congratulations on the uh the big 30 year anniversary yeah i mean it's 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 kind of weird when you look back and say like, well, it's really been 30 years but the thing is i've been doing other stuff as well you know so criminal has never officially broken up but this been periods of inactivity you know where i've been more busy with some of my other projects and stuff mm -hmm. you know but uh yeah but it's always been like my pet project because you know it's 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 uh i can i can do whatever i want with this band really and um yeah it's it's crazy that it's been 30 years it's been ups and downs you know we've been we've had great times you know we've had great uh landmark shows like we, we opened for metallica in santiago like 12 years ago or something like that and there were like 50,000 people there yeah. you know so it's 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 yeah you, you've had like i've seen it all with this band really man that's so cool man so speaking of kind of seeing it all and speaking of things that aren't really around much anymore you guys got a lot of airtime on mtv latin america in the 90s i say they're not around even though like the video music awards were just earlier this week, but uh, it's, it's not the same as it was. Right. Oh, they don't really, they don't really play music anymore. So yeah. you, should probably, you <laughs> yeah. should drop the M out of MTV really. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so, so the, the whole being, being on MTV, what was that like? Was that something that was handled more by the label getting music videos on airtime is a lot different then as it is now similarly getting played on things like satellite radio or Spotify or whatever it might be. Can you tell us a little bit about that process? Well, um, let's see. It, it, yeah, it is true that uh, MTV Latin America was a very big thing for us. You know, it's, it's something that really made us well known across the continent, you know, and uh, I, actually the guy who, uh, hosted the show, the Headbangers show, I mean, the, the metal show on MTV Latino. And he was an old friend of mine, you know, I knew him from from when we were kids, you know, hanging out and listening to Venom, you know. So um, he, well, he obviously, maybe uh, he helped us a little bit. And, um, but the label, yeah, the label, they, they invested in us, you know, they were absolutely aware that it was important to have cool looking videos you know so they would get played on mtv and uh, that's what they did you know they they invested a lot of money well a lot of money for for what it wasn't at the time but um yeah they, they definitely they, they knew this angle you know of promotion 
and it helped it helped so much you know it it, it uh, allowed us to tour pretty much all over the continent we played in argentina uruguay uh, peru colombia venezuela mexico you know it's it's yeah we we we, we did a lot back then uh, it was the, the first 10 years were really really busy and really big for right. us in south america right the south american scene has always kind of been like that and i feel like it is still like that today i've never personally been uh even to the you know north american parts of latin america like mexico and the central america kind of areas but everyone that i know that has played shows there is always just like dude it was wild like the the crowds and the fans and the treatment it's just so cool and so uh like people never really grew out of it there i feel like you said something at the beginning of this interview where it was like yeah i think people kind of like to romanticize that period of time but for me I think that a lot of people, especially because it's kind of harder for bands from outside of the area to get down there and play, really romanticize the experience of playing in South America because you still get that quote unquote rock star treatment, right? And uh, it sounds like that's pretty in line with what your experience was uh, coming up in that scene, especially like you said, during those first 10 years of Criminal. Well, yeah, I think we, in a way, we laid a groundwork for for all that what was to come later, you know. Yeah. Because we we actually we managed to 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 build a scene, you know. A, a really, you know, there were different bands. There were magazine like fanzines and stuff. You know, everybody knew each other. Everybody helped each other out, you know. And uh, by the time the first band like the first international band landed in Chile, which was created in 92, which was actually the first criminal show ever supporting creator that very first time they, they so came cool. to Chile. Um, it was absolutely insane, you know, and 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 we, we kind of realized that there was a spark that we had ignited something because it just kept growing, you know, when then like a couple of years later, Sepultura came to Chile and, and Slayer and stuff, you know, and it was just like a wildfire and more and more people would show up. I mean, back in the day when I was still in Pentagram, sometimes we had like 2000 people showing up for the right. shows, you know, but then when the international bands started coming in, it was just insane, you know, it would just, it, it, and, and it's, yeah, like you said, you know, um, people in South America, in general and specifically in Chile, they are so crazy, so passionate about this music that it's it's absolutely great. And yeah, and that's why pretty much every band I know that has played in South America says, yeah, that's the best audience in the world, you yeah. know? Yeah. So I uh, speaking of crazy shows, I, I know we touched on this briefly, but I'm getting some uh, some interest from some, some outside parties. Uh, so that Metallica show that you mentioned, I feel like we need to talk about that a little bit. Like, how how did that happen? How was it, you know, playing in front of that many people is always exciting when you play the big festivals and stuff like that. But playing with that many people, supporting a band like Metallica, had to be something super cool. Uh, tell us a little bit more about that. Oh, yeah, it was insane. I mean, I think that the the uh, the promoter contacted us, actually, because they knew we would have had a name, you know, in Chile, and they wanted to, you know, some... And actually, they had to get the approval from Metallica management to, to get us to play. So uh, the Metallica people actually listened to our stuff and said, yeah, cool, thumbs up, you know, they can play, you know, and it was it was weird because for some reason i don't remember why but our drummer of the time couldn't make it uh because of his work or something like that because it was relatively short notice and i had just started to play in lockup you know and uh so i asked nick barker if he wanted to play with us with metallica and obviously it's a bucket list kind of thing for everyone so he said "Fuck yeah but uh, yeah, but it was a very short time to learn a lot of songs, you know, but but he did a great job. And what was funny, or what I most remember about this whole thing is that um, we had, um, it was, um, the, the backstage was all tents, you know, it, it, backstage tent. So we had our backstage tent 
And it was pretty close to this container where Metallica warm up before they go on stage, you know? Right. And, and so it was so fucking weird. We were there in a backstage tent and Metallica were like the house band playing for us, you know, next door in this fucking container. And, and fucking Lars would fucking keep, keep fucking up the song. <laughs> and they had to stop it and stuff. It was super fucking funny, man. And then, uh, and then yeah, actually, um, when they finished uh, the, the warm up, we some guy from the production came and said, uh, well, Metallica would like to meet the support band, you know, and uh, fuck, yeah, let's go, man. Yeah. So it, it was great. I mean, it was very short. They just came out of this container, you know, and we just shook hands and took a few pictures. They all came out shit, you know, back then the cell phones weren't very good with yeah. pictures and stuff, you know, so. It, it, but there, there are pictures. I, I, I mean, there's proof that we were there and it's uh, it was so cool because uh, James Hetfield walked straight to me and said, hey, man, what's up? You know, let's yeah. take a peek. <laughs> he knew what's up, man. <laughs> that's so cool, man. Well, I'm glad we touched back on that because that's a that's a really cool story. I want to mention, uh, since since you brought the guy up, I am a huge Nick Barker fan. I grew up uh, listening to him on particular albums that really influenced me as a younger, you know, 12, 13 year old metal kid. Uh, particularly his work with Cradle of Filth, Demon War Gear, and Old Man's Child. So super cool yeah. that uh, you guys are buds. And uh, tell him, tell him I said I love his drumming. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, man. Anyway, uh, th yeah, that's super cool, man. That's that's it's it's so interesting to hear these types of stories, uh, especially you know because you said that was what like 12, 12 years ago ish. Like it's it's cool hearing that. Yeah it has never really de-escalated for you guys, even with those kind of dry spell periods that you were talking about while you were working on other stuff. So I want to, you know, you mentioned that you moved to England and Europe uh, in 2001. And yeah. you've, you've talked about this a little bit in other interviews, but for the people who don't know the history of the band, can you explain why you made that move? Um... I guess um, th th there were two two kind of sides to it. One of them was that I, as a person, I was kind of uh, bored or uh, tired of you know being in the same place all the time. You know, I really wanted a change of scenery. You know, and uh, experience something new in my life. At the same time, sorry. At the same time. I kind of felt that uh, Criminal had achieved pretty much everything that we could down in South America, you know. By that time, we had played like Monsters of Rock with Slayer and Anthrax and stuff, you know. We had played with Motorhead and with Exodus and whatnot, you know, so many bands. And, and uh, but it's, we, we were kind of trying to move, but we weren't getting anywhere. And add to that, that in like in the late 90s, the whole record industry fell into a deep crisis because of the whole downloading thing you know the napsters and whatever you know right so um i remember we just got back from our first us tour 99 i think and um the label told us well we can only give you half the budget we gave you for last for the last album I'm like what you know i mean what, what's the point you know why why are we supposed to be on a major label if you don't have any money you know and you don't want to push our career right and it's actually true I, I think that always you know they um they always concentrated too much on the chilean market and maybe south america but they failed to give us a big push to go and and um you know go to the big leagues you know so yeah, I, I thought yeah, this is there is no point in just keep keeping keeping on doing this here. So yeah, I just decided to go. And, and to be honest, when I left, I, I didn't really know if I was gonna keep playing music or not, on what level or whatever. But naturally, you know, when I got to England, I met immediately. I met musicians. You know, I, I immediately got connected with the scene over there. 
I actually played guitar for Extreme Noise Terror for some time as well, you know, which was pretty cool. Hell yeah. Um, and um, yeah, that's the way I met uh, Zach, who went on to be our drummer for the next 20 years or something or more, you know? Yeah, almost 20 years. So uh, um, yeah, we kind of relaunched the band over there. Uh, the ties with Metal Blade were still there. You know, our, our uh, 2004 album, No Gods, No Masters, which was the first one we did in Europe, came out on Metal Blade as well. So, um, yeah, we just took it from there. It, it, it kind of, it, it was different. It, it, it all, it, it, it was like a, um, like a break in, like a breaking point in our, in the band history, you know, but uh, we managed to carry on. We did, some pretty cool stuff, you know, and uh, still here we are. You know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So in, in retrospect, seemed like it was the right move to make. Uh, sounds like I don't it. know. I don't know. I mean, uh, yeah, I, I think it was definitely, I mean, for me personally, it was definitely the right move to make um, because I needed, I really needed the change of air, you know, and yeah. uh, maybe, I mean, you know, always there, when you make a decision, you always wonder what, would have been if you made the opposite decision, oh, yeah, you know, and, of course. and, and uh, in that, in that respect, I think that uh, maybe I sh because I only lived in England for two years, maybe I should have stayed there for longer because I started to meet a lot of people. I knew a lot of the bands, you know, a lot of the, the, the musicians and, and maybe I could have got connected better there. And I decided to move to Germany. I actually worked for metal blade for five years in Germany. Oh, nice. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. The Germany office. So um, yeah, I I, I worked uh, there and uh, and eventually I moved to Spain uh, in two thousand and eight, I think it was seven. So um, yeah, it's been a wild ride, man. Yeah. No, that's super cool, man. It's uh, it's it's you know I keep saying this, but it's all so interesting to me to see how this band's path has been carved out and and changed over the years uh a lot of bands kind of just stick with one thing forever and then release 10 albums and, and disappear right but it sounds <laughs> yeah. it sounds like even before criminal and now with all these other projects that you have going on that it's just such an interesting and varied path that uh your musical career has carried so it's it's i'm i'm, I'm just sitting here just like god this is so cool <laughs> like well uh, it's, it's been i can say it's been pretty unusual because um it was just over 10 years ago or so that uh the chain called me up and asked me to join lockup you know and uh i did and then like five or six years ago i got the call from nick to come to join brujeria you know, and it's it's been weird because it's like my career as a musician really started to pick up after, well in my into my 40s, you know, yeah. which is pretty unusual. You know, a lot of people in the industry tell you if you don't make it by 30, then you're done, you're toast, you know, yeah. and uh, but I, I don't know if it was just. I was stubborn enough maybe, or <laughs> I don't know, I, I just stuck <laughs> to my guns. And it's, uh, it's interesting because of course, I mean, your musical abilities, your creativity is one thing, but also you, in this business, you got to, um, you got to know how to get along with people. You got to know how to work with people, you know, and it's, it's, it's a big part, you know, if you're going to be, on tour with a band for the best of five years or something like that you have to be a team player you know and if you're not then you're not for this job you know yeah absolutely networking is huge in this industry from every part of it whether you're on the front end as a musician or on the back end as someone trying to get your foot in the door doing anything booking promoting managing it's all about how well you network and the relationships that you can form and creating that rapport between yourself and anyone else uh absolutely but i have to say there there's a lot of i've seen it you know there's a lot of uh there's a lot of bullshit as well you know there's a lot of people who just want to sweet talk you into mm -hmm. you know believing that are oh, the you're a great guy or whatever you know and it's uh you just i don't know i mean i prefer people who are true to themselves you know exactly. and who are who are, who are who they are you know and even if sometimes maybe 
they're not the nicest people in the world, but they 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 mean what they say, you know. And yeah, uh, um, yeah I've 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 heard and seen a lot of bullshitters. In yeah. this scene. <laughs> well, that's that's what I was gonna say. I was gonna follow up with that. Is that it's you know you need to be good at networking. You need to be able to communicate and build a rapport with people, but you need to do so from a platform of uh, being genuine. You know, yeah, being yourself. You exactly. Know? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. The passion is is what drives this entire sector of the industry especially in metal you know there's other parts of the music industry where that that bullshit and that falseness uh can take you a long way because that's what that part of the industry caters to but for metal and rock music in general the passion for the music is always what brings the people together and so that that extends far 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 beyond even just the listeners but like we're talking about the people in the industry the people in the bands who make the wheels turn around uh you gotta you gotta have that love and i think that it is very obvious when a person doesn't so yeah uh, yeah that's awesome and i would say i mean if if I, if I may add that uh maybe i i still retain that kind of naive sort of enthusiasm and and uh fanship you know i really love this music you know and uh and uh, the fact that i've only just recently kind of become successful in this business has made me all the more appreciative for it you know i i i appreciate it much more i think than a lot of other people i've met a lot of people in bands who are pretty successful or very successful but they are just miserable people and they just interested in the dollar and, 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 and they don't care about the music or the fans or anything, you know, and it's just a business, you know, and I hope, yeah. I mean, when that happens to me, I'd rather retire and do something else, you know? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Never let yourself get so jaded that you uh, lose sight of why you started doing what you're doing. That's the way to be. Exactly. Absolutely. Exactly. So I, I want to mention real quick and I feel like kind of an idiot going into this interview without doing my research uh, because I knew about Pentagram and, you know, my my fandom of, of that band is a fan of just old school death metal. But I did not know that you were also in Brujeria, which is a band that I love. <laughs> I love that band. So, well, we're 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 covered with bandanas. So, yeah, that's true. That's true. <laughs> I uh, I have some. I friends. don't know if that works. I don't know if that works anymore. Really, you know that, that gimmick of you know the the unknowns. Well, it's I, just, it's just in the in the age of the internet, it's just not possible to keep that up. So, so I feel I, I feel like there is a certain amount of allure that still comes with that. Um, and you know, coincidentally enough, I they're they're also a, a Latin American band, but I have some friends that are in a band uh, called Unidad Trauma that was oh yeah, they're great, yeah, they're great, yeah, yeah I love I those love guys, them. and they were Thanatology before that, and they you know yeah. I just I just went to an Unidad show like a couple weeks ago because uh, I live in San Diego, and so um, you know they still have the whole thing like the big masks and like it's like all you can see is just their eyes peeking out through, and I think that it just it adds such a cool element to it because it really makes you focus on the music you know like the oh, yeah. the the costume show is kind of you know its own cool thing and they have you know little elements that they bring to the show that cooperate so to speak right with the whole masked thing but uh the face covering I, i've always i've always thought was really cool maybe it's just because i'm a little older i don't know yeah, I think, uh, I, well, when for me, Brujeria was a big deal when they came on the scene back in the 90s. First two albums, we were like, what the fuck is this? You know, this is really, this is so brutal. And they were singing in Spanish, you know, they yeah. were singing directly to us, you know. So it was, it was really exciting. And then when I got to see them live, I also thought that the whole thing that they were covered, you know, and the, they did all these movements and stuff like that, it was, so powerful you know yeah. and uh and yeah so when i got the call i was like fuck yes this yeah. is like a job man it's 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 easy they it, it's easy to play the songs which is great yeah because exactly in lockup for example i just have to really be concentrating on what i'm doing brujeria is just yeah you can just be a badass and yeah 
there and just do it. You know, it's my favorite kind of band, man. So let's fast forward a little bit to to today and the new album, Sacrificio, uh, coming out on Metal Blade, as mentioned at the beginning of this interview, in just a couple days here on the seventeenth. So yeah. tell us a little bit about the writing experience for this. You you did it you know, from, from what has been told in other interviews, kind of the, the old fashioned way, right. Of just kind of jamming in a practice room, hashing it out as a band. Uh, a lot of bands nowadays, as I'm sure, you know, but for the listeners who might not do a lot of things remotely, right? Like it's some guy will record stuff at home and he'll send it to another guy who will add his parts. And you do that four or five times. And then you have, you know, a a demo that, or a pre-pro everybody kind of puts their thoughts on it and, that's just kind of how albums are written by a lot of bands. You know, my band included, we live all over the country. Um, what do you think the benefits are from getting in a room and really just working it out together as musicians? Uh, I don't know. I mean, the last few criminal albums, I pretty much wrote myself in front of a computer, you know, just riff number one, riff number two, and oh, okay, we'll copy and paste. And then, Oh, it needs a bridge now, whatever. But you don't really have a feedback from anybody, you know. You just think you're great writing this. Oh, this riff is really good, you know. But um, when you're in a rehearsal room, you get an immediate reaction from the other person. You know, I was it was pretty much Danilo and myself, you know, just the drummer and me writing this album. And I um, and uh, you you get an immediate reaction. Sometimes you play a riff, and you could, just by the look on his face, you could tell yes or no, you know. Yeah. And um, if it's yes, then we start jamming on it, and and it's it's this immediate collaborative collaborative process and the immediate feedback that you get that in a way makes it so much more spontaneous, you know rather than yeah just sitting there and then i'll send on my files to the other guy and it's it's it's, uh i don't know it's a completely different thing you know and back in the day back in the 80s that's the way we would write you know we would write in the fucking rehearsal room and that's what we did now and uh, i think that's and you could i think if you listen to the album you can actually tell you know it was written that way because it's so spontaneous the songs are short you know we didn't get into a lot of you know dragging it out and stuff you know it's just you know, to the point, kind of like if we were playing live, because that's the feeling you get when you got a loud amp, you know, and loud drums and it's and you're sweating it out in a small rehearsal room. It's it's a completely different feeling, you know? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I uh, I completely agree. My band did something similar for this last album as well. Um, and not only has it been with a legion that I've done things very remotely and had files sent to me that I just have to write on top of as a vocalist, but with pretty much every other death metal band that I've released albums with. Um, So to get into, you know, taking these, these writing retreats as we called them, where everybody travels out to the same city, we all sit together for a week or two and really hash through the details, get everybody's input, try to get all the creative stuff going on it made such a huge difference in my opinion yeah. to the dynamic of the album. So I think that it's really cool that you, you did that for this last album uh, because it, it really mirrors my experience with the last album that I wrote uh, and, and just knowing firsthand what a huge difference it makes getting that human element and that real time feedback is, is super, super cool. Um, so yeah, I think so. I mean, it, it, it can get frustrating as well. You oh, know, because yeah. sometimes, sometimes you hit a brick wall and you're just looking at each other and it's like nothing is really flowing, you know, and it can be really, really frustrating. But then sometimes it's just better to call it a day. You know, we'll come back tomorrow. We carry on then. But let's, let's not get frustrated, you know, because it's the worst thing you can do. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Lots of butting of heads for sure can, can definitely oh, yeah. happen. It's, it's uh, when you have that many cooks in the kitchen as as they say you can step on each other's toes and all that stuff but it's like you said it's important to know that you're all working towards the same goal and that even though sometimes it's frustrating and the the output isn't exactly what you want it to be in that exact moment it's always something that you can come back to on a fresh head and usually after getting frustrated about it it gives you time to process it and then you come back to it and the 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 
end result or the output that you put forward ends up being so much better. And at least Absolutely. in my experience. Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, you went back to Chile to record this record. Uh, production by uh, Seba Puente, really natural sounding, very, very like organic old school death metal kind of production on this. Tell us a little bit about what the process was like getting that sound and why it's important to the criminal sound in general. Well, I think it was an extension to the writing process, you know, because the writing process was was so so dynamic, so organic, so spontaneous that this really needed to show in the production. And uh, we first made a couple demos at the Sebas uh, studio and we, we started talking and we pretty soon we realized that we were on the same wavelength in terms of what we wanted, you know, sound wise. We wanted a natural sound, something that sounded like real drums and real amps, as opposed to a lot of the stuff that's out nowadays, you know, that is, you know, all the drums are sampled, you know, and you're using these uh, um, amp simulators, which are pretty good, but not quite like the real thing, I think. And um, yeah, I mean, he, he, he completely understood that. And, uh, but we also knew that it, it's a risk to do this like the old school way, like with proper mics and everything, because you can lose a certain uh, element of, of that, that shiny sort of, sort of production, you know, that, that really, you, and, and most of the kids nowadays are probably uh, used to that sort of sound you know so maybe something too old school sounding they probably say like oh this is not very good you know see it's it's funny that you say that because over the past couple of years there has been a pretty big revival of old school death metal production and i think that that's a byproduct of so many years right because you started getting that really polished really dialed in very sample replaced and amp profiler type of production in yeah. god like back in like 2006 2007 a lot mm -hmm. of uh california technical death metal bands started doing a lot of that stuff back then and uh i think that after 15 years of hearing that you know what i mean people have kind of started to gravitate more towards that organic natural, natural sound yeah. yeah you have bands like vitriol or uh blood incantation for example is another good one that it's just like uh -huh. super uh -huh. old school sounding man it has that old school death metal vibe to yeah. it and uh i think i think if if there were a time to release a death metal album that is true to the roots of old school production now is definitely the time because people are Probably. are stoked on that again which makes me uh -huh. stoked because i love all of that just organic crunchy heaviness that comes from that old school death metal kind of vibe hm2s man hm2s all the way <laughs> yeah well we didn't use hm2s but uh i just i just need to be very unprofessional for a second i need to plug in this mac because otherwise it's oh goes... yeah man no worries no worries but uh, so i'm gonna move around a little bit but we can still keep talking yeah of it's course well while you're problem. while you're determining the future of your laptop's battery life uh tell us a little bit about what the plans for the future of criminal are um well right now it's pretty much up in the air everything you know because um uh, we've been talking about some tours some festivals and stuff like that but here it is hey but um, there's nothing certain yet, you know. We are now planning to do some sort of a release show in Chile, or maybe even a small tour at the end of the year, because Chile is opening up. You know, the numbers are good. You know, the pandemic and all the shit. You know, over eighty percent of the people are vaccinated, so it's it's all going pretty well. But still, it's it's nothing is certain yeah. right now. Yeah. You know, so uh, that's why we haven't had haven't made really uh, very big plans for the immediate future. But we're trying. We are we are uh, in talks with some festivals for next year, even though it's it's been quite difficult as well, because 
pretty much all the festivals that were booked for this year they just like just moved all the bands to the next year so their bills are full so it's pretty difficult to get a, a foot in the door there but um we'll see we'll see you know we we are uh, we just want to concentrate on getting the album out now you know finish the promotion and uh perhaps we even do like uh the online streaming sort of release show playing the entire album or something like that. It's yeah. been talked about, you know, so we'll see, we'll see, but I'm not, I'm not, uh, uh, desperate. I've, I've, uh, I've kind of, uh, learned to live with the uncertainty by now. Yeah. You know? Yeah, absolutely, man. Well, I don't want to keep you too much longer. I appreciate that you've spent this much time with us as it is, but, uh, before we go, uh, is there anything else that you're working on? Anything else that you want to uh, mention to the listeners who may not be familiar with you or your other projects? Well, absolutely. I have uh, a new album coming up with uh, Lock Up, which we recorded entirely in uh, pandemic mode, you know, um, and that th- this was that way, you know, sending files back and forth because there was no other way to do it, you know, but um, it worked out pretty good. If, if I may say so myself, um, we got a new drummer, Adam Jarvis from Misery Index, yeah. Pink Destroyer, you know, he's in the band now. And now we've got Thomas from At The Gates back in the band. So nice. we've got a dual vocal attack, Kevin Sharp and Thomas Lindbergh. I mean, it's two of the greatest um, extreme metal vocalists ever, you know, together in one band. What could possibly go wrong, right? <laughs> so... Um, yeah, we got an album coming out. I think it's coming out in November or something like that. We're going to launch the first single at the end of this month. Um, other things I've been working on during the pandemic, I've been writing stuff for a new Pentagram album, Ooh. which we're going to, yeah, we're going to start recording that pretty soon, I guess. Uh, because I've only just realized that the last album we did is like, almost like eight or nine years ago yeah <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> that's been a while so uh well but the clocks to tick differently in pentagram land i guess yeah. and um and the brujeria have a new album on the way too uh we are mixing it as we speak you know so uh so there's a lot of stuff coming your way dude that i personally am very excited for all of that news i am so stoked to hear all of that straight from the horse's mouth that's super cool uh well thank you man for hanging out for those of you watching uh anton reisenegger obviously a man of many talents and many bands uh releasing uh sacrificio via metal blade records uh very soon in just a couple days if you want a little taster there's a video out for one of the songs a little pre-release that you can check out as well Make sure to check out all of those things at metalblade.com slash criminal and follow criminal uh, at the social media links that you see posted just below our beautiful, beautiful faces. Uh, Thanks again, man, so much for for joining us. It's been super, super cool talking to you. Thank you very much, man. It's uh, it's been a pleasure. You know, it's been it's always nice to talk to someone who knows their shit, you know, and uh, who appreciates what uh, what we do, you know, and uh, yeah. And uh, I'm a big fan of your band, too, you know, hey, so uh, thanks, <laughs> keep, keep up the good work. And um, I hope to meet you. We are actually talking about doing a festival with Brujeria and Tijuana in November. Ooh. I don't know if it's going to work out, but if it does, you're just around the corner. Yeah, you know? man, keep me posted. I'll be there in a, in a, in a minute. Uh, a Legion also currently has plans to tour in the European area uh, in November as well. So hopefully our paths cross sooner than later. Cool, man. Hell yeah, man. Well, for Good those pleasure. of you watching, thank you so much, Anton. Thank you again for joining us. I'm Riley McShane, host of the Metal Blade live series and singer for Metal Blade Band Allegion, and I will catch you next time. Thanks again, everybody.